Legendary Passages, Episode 31, Intro to the Argonauts, Jason's Quest for the Golden Fleece, from the Library of Apollodorus. For the next six episodes, we shall get an overview of the stories of Jason, the Argonauts, and Medea. But first, we briefly cover the story of Alcestis, whom died so her husband Admetus might live. Hercules rescues her from her untimely death. Admetus' cousin was Aeson, whose son Jason one day lost his sandal on his way to a sacrifice. An oracle had told King Peleus to beware of a one-sandaled man, so he charged the youth with getting the golden fleece from a far-off country. A massive ship was built, named after its creator Argo, and fifty princes and heroes joined in on the quest, including Hercules, Theseus, and one woman named Atalanta. First they landed in Lemnos, an island without men. Second was the Delionese, ruled by King Cyzicus, whom they slew in a misunderstanding. At Mysia, young Hylas was abducted by nymphs and was never found. Hercules would not abandon the youth, but the Argo sailed on without them. In the Berbices, King Amicus was killed by Pollux in a boxing match. In Salamidesis, they saved the blind seer Phineas from the Harpies, and he told them how to sail past the clashing rocks. Next time, we review the fables of the Argonauts and the tragic love of Jason and Medea, the same woman who first married the father of Theseus. The chronology gets somewhat complicated, as we shall see. Intro to the Argonauts A Legendary Passage From the Library of Apollodorus Translated by J. G. Fraser Phary, son of Cretheus, founded Phary in Thessaly and begat Admetus and Lycurgus. Lycurgus took up his abode at Nemea, and having married Eurydice, or, as some say, Ampathea, he begat Ophelides, afterwards called Archimerus. When Admetus reigned over Phary, Apollo served him as his thrall, while Admetus wooed Alcestis, daughter of Peleus. Now Peleus had promised to give his daughter to him, who should yoke a lion and boar to a car, and Apollo yoked and gave them to Admetus, who brought them to Peleus, and so obtained Alcestis. But in offering a sacrifice at his marriage, he forgot to sacrifice to Artemis. Therefore, when he opened up the marriage chamber, he found it full of coiled snakes. Apollo bade him appease the goddess, and obtained as a favor of the fates that, when Admetus should be about to die, he might be released from death if someone would choose voluntarily to die for him. And when the day of his death came, neither his father nor his mother would die for him, but Alcestis died in his stead. But the maiden sent her up again, or, as some say, Hercules fought with Hades and brought her up to him. Aeson, son of Cretheus, had a son Jason by Polymede, daughter of Atilicus. Now Jason dwelt in Aeolcus, of which Peleus was king after Cretheus. But when Peleus consulted the oracle concerning the kingdom, the god warned him to beware of the man with a single sandal. At first the king understood not the oracle, but afterwards he apprehended it. For when he was offering a sacrifice at sea to Poseidon, he sent for Jason, among many others, to participate in it. Now Jason loved husbandry, and therefore abode in the country, but he hastened to the sacrifice, and in crossing the river Anaris, he lost a sandal in the stream, and landed with only one. When Peleus saw him, he bethought him of the oracle, and going up to Jason, asked him what, supposing he had the power, he would do if he received an oracle that he should be murdered by one of the citizens. Jason answered, whether at haphazard or instigated by an angry Hera, in order that Medea should prove a curse to Peleus, who did not honor Hera. I would command him, he said, to bring the golden fleece. No sooner did Peleus hear that than he bade him go in quest of the fleece. Now it was at Colchis in a grove of Ares, hanging on an oak and guarded by a sleepless dragon. Sent to fetch the fleece, Jason called in the help of Argus, son of Phrixus. And Argus, by Athena's advice, built a ship of forty oars named Argo after its builder. And at the prow, Athena fitted a speaking timber from the oak of Dodona. When the ship was built, and he inquired of the oracle, God gave him leave to assemble the nobles of Greece and sail away. And those who assembled were as follows. Tiphys, son of Hagnius, who steered the ship, 
Orpheus, son of Origaris. Zetes and Calais, sons of Boreas. Castor and Pollux, sons of Zeus. Telamon and Peleus, sons of Aeacus. Hercules, son of Zeus. Theseus, son of Aegeus. Idas and Lysinus, sons of Apharius. Amphiaris, son of Eocles. Caeneus, son of Coronis. Haliamon, son of Hephaestus, or of Atolus. Cephas, son of Aeleus. Laertes, son of Acrisilus. Atolicus, son of Hermes. Atalanta, daughter of Shronius. Minotius, son of Actor. Actor, son of Epasus. Admetus, son of Pheres. Acastus, son of Peleus. Eurytus, son of Hermes. Meleager, son of Onius. Ancaeus, son of Lycurgus. Euphemus, son of Poseidon. Poeus, son of Tamachus. Butes, son of Telon. Phanus and Staphylus, sons of Dionysus. Herginus, son of Poseidon. Heraclymenus, son of Neleus. Augeus, son of the sun. Hyphiclus, son of Thestius. Argus, son of Phrixus. Herialis, son of Mesistius. Penelius, son of Apomus. Letus, son of Elector. Iphitus, son of Nabolus. Ascaphilus and Eolomenus, sons of Ares. Asterius, son of Cometes. Polyphemus, son of Alatus. These with Jason as admiral put to sea and touched at Lemnos. At that time it chanced that Lemnos was bereft of men, and ruled over by a queen, Hypsipyle, daughter of Thaos, the reason of which was as follows. The Lemnian women did not honor Aphrodite, and she visited them with a noisome smell. Therefore their spouses took captive women from the neighboring country of Thrace and bedded with them. Thus dishonored, the Lemnian women murdered their fathers and husbands. But Hypsipyle alone saved her father Thaos by hiding him. So having put in to Lemnos, at that time ruled by women, the Argonauts had intercourse with the women, and Hypsipyle bedded with Jason and bore sons, Unius and Menebrophanus. And after Lemnos they landed among the Diolines, of whom Zizicus was king. He received them kindly, but having put to sea from there by night, and met with contrary winds, they lost their bearings and landed again among the Diolines. However, the Diolines, taking them for a Pelagassian army, for they were constantly harassed by the Pelagassians, joined battle with them by night in mutual ignorance of each other. The Argonauts slew many, and among the rest Zizicus. By day, when they knew what they had done, they mourned and cut off their hair, and gave Zizicus the costly burial. And after the burial, they sailed away and touched at Mysia. There they left Hercules and Polyphemus, for Hylus, son of Thyodamus, a minion of Hercules, had been sent to draw water and was ravished away by nymphs on account of his beauty. Polyphemus heard him cry out, and drawing his sword gave chase in the belief that he was being carried off by robbers. Falling in with Hercules, he told him, and while the two were seeking for Hylus, the ship put to sea. So Polyphemus founded a city, Seus, in Mysia, and reigned as king, but Hercules returned to Argos. However, Herodotus says that Hercules did not sail at all at the time, but served as a slave at the court of Omphal. But Pherecydes says that he was left behind at Ephidi in Thessaly, the Argo having declared with human voice that she could not bear his weight. Nevertheless, Demartus has recorded that Heracles sailed to Colchis, for Dionysus even affirms that he was the leader of the Argonauts. From Mysia they departed to the land of the Berberses, which was ruled by King Amicus, son of Poseidon, and a Bithian nymph. Being a doughty man, he compelled the strangers that landed to box, and in that way made an end of them. So going to the Argo as usual, he challenged the best man of the crew to a boxing match. Pollux undertook to box against him, and killed him with a blow on the elbow. When the Berberses made a rush at him, the chiefs snatched up their arms and put them to flight with great slaughter. Thence they put to sea, and came to land at Salmodesus in Thrace, where dealt Phineas, a seer who had lost the sight of both eyes. Some say that he was a son of Agenor, but others that he was a son of Poseidon, and is variously alleged to have been blinded by the gods for foretelling men about the future. 
or by Boreas and the Argonauts because he blinded his own sons at the instigation of their stepmother, or by Poseidon because he revealed to the children of Phrixus how they could sail from Colchis to Greece. The gods also sent harpies to him. These were winged female creatures, and when a table was laid for Phineas, they flew down from the sky and snatched up most of the victuals, and what little they left stank so that nobody could touch it. When the Argonauts would have consulted him about the voyage, he said that he would advise them about it if they would rid him of the harpies. So the Argonauts laid a table of viands beside him, and the harpies with a shriek suddenly pounced down and snatched away the food. When Zetes and Calais, the sons of Boreas, saw that, they drew their swords, and being winged, pursued them through the air. Now it was fated that the harpies should perish by the sons of Boreas, and that the sons of Boreas should die when they could not catch a fugitive. So the harpies were pursued, and one of them fell in the river Tigris in the Peloponnese, the river that is now called Harpies after her. Some call her Nicotho, but others Elopis. But the other, named Ossipede, or according to others, Ossitho, but Hesia calls her Ossipode, flew by the Propontis till she came to the Echinadian Islands, which are now called Sterphades after her. For when she came to them, she turned, and being at the shore, fell for very weariness with her pursuer. But Apollonius the Argonautica says that the harpies were pursued to the Strophades Islands and suffered no harm, having sworn an oath they would wrong Phineas no more. Being rid of the harpies, Phineas revealed to the Argonauts the course of their voyage, and advised them about the clashing rocks in the sea. These were huge cliffs, which, dashed together by the force of the winds, closed the sea passage. Thick was the mist that swept over them, and loud the crash and it was impossible for even the birds to pass between them. So he told them to let fly a dove between the rocks, and, if they saw it pass safe through, to thread the narrows with an easy mind, but if they saw it perish, then not to force a passage. When they heard that, they put to sea, and nearing the rocks they let fly a dove from the prow, and as she flew, the crash of the rocks nipped off the tip of her tail. So, waiting till the rocks had recoiled, with hard rowing and the help of Hera, they passed through, the extremity of a ship's ornamented poop being shorn away right round. Henceforth the clashing rocks stood still, for it was fated that, so soon as a ship had made the passage, they should come to rest completely. <laughs>